Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our UCSF Orthopedic Surgery Grand Rounds. Um, it is my honor today to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Ryan Freshman. Uh, Dr. Freshman is one of our uh, fourth year residents. Uh, he uh, completed his undergraduate work at UCLA and then medical school at Northwestern uh, before coming out uh, to UCSF uh, for his residency. Um, he is currently um, applying for sports medicine fellowship um, and has a bright future in um, that specialty. Um, Dr. Freshman has been very active in research, um, has numerous publications, just came off uh, presenting at our academy meeting last week in Chicago. Um, he's been active in our uh, play safe sports coverage, um, covering football games through the city. Um, and um, he's going to be speaking to us today on the role of social media in orthopedic surgery. Uh, so Dr. Freshman, thanks so much for being here and uh, look forward to your talk. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Lansdowne. And I'm excited that I can and talk with you all today. And I hope everybody finds this topic as interesting as I continue to find it as I was doing work to research for it. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the role of social media in orthopedic surgery. I can say I don't have any financial disclosures related to the stock, but I do have an Instagram account. I do have a Facebook account and I do have a LinkedIn account. Um, so just a, a bit of an outline. We'll, talk, we'll start by talking about the birth of social networking and social media and then discuss how social media can be used in a positive way within orthopedics. Afterwards, we'll talk about some of the potential pitfalls that you might find with social media use. And then at the end, briefly discuss some of the proper use guidelines that are outlined by um, the AAAOS. <clears throat> So what is social media? Um, so if you look at the dictionary, the Merriam-Webster dictionary would define it as forms of electronic communication, such as websites for social networking and microblogging through which users create online communities to share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content such as videos. And when you take that definition, and when I ask, would ask you to think of what social media is, I bet that most of you, um, if not all, are thinking about one of the companies that are listed on this slide. But I think the interesting thing about social media lies in the vagueness of the definition. It can really be anything from apps promoting social networks to videos to blog postings and more. And really it's just a framework um, through which we communicate with others and disseminate information and ideas. And when we to talk a little bit about the history of social media, I think it's only fitting to go back to the original network, which of course was the Telegraph. Um, and this was invented by Samuel Morse back in the 1800s. And on May 24th, 18, 1844, uh, he first sent the first ever telegraph message from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, Maryland. And on that message, he sent, what had God wrought? Or what hath God wrought? Um, which I find to be a very fitting statement um, because the man who made transcontinental communication possible would probably be in awe if he lived to see how communication in the modern age would transform over the next 150 years. And then the first form of modern networking was ARPANET, which was the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. This was created by ARPA, which is the pre precursor to DARPA, which is part of the Department of Defense today. ARPANET was developed to enable near instantaneous general communications between computers. And this rolled out in 1969. It consisted of four interface message processors, one at UCLA, Stanford, UCSB, and Utah. Um, on October 29th, 1969, they managed to send the first successful message between researchers at UCLA and Stanford. They tried to type login, but they only got the first two letters LO before the system crashed. Um, however, the message still sent. And then by 1989, commercial internet service providers came into existence and ARPANET was decommissioned. And on December 20th, 1990, Tim Berners-Lee, then a computer scientist at CERN, launched the first website on the World Wide Web, giving birth to the internet as we know it today. And if you move forward another 30 years, everyone today, most people have a computer. Um, they're much smaller and they usually don't crash when you're trying to send a message to your friends. Just to mention some key dates in social media. In 1997, the first social media site, Six Degrees, was formed. In 2002, um, LinkedIn became the first professional social networking site. In 2004, Facebook was founded. In 2006, Twitter was founded. And in 2010, uh, Instagram was founded. And when you look at this timeline, there's this large gap between 2010 and 2022 here. Um, but what you also see is that most of these companies listed here are the same ones that we know and use today. And so there's this period of growth over these 12 years from 2010 or 2010 to 2022, 
um, which represents an increase in daily active users in the geographic reach of social media. And research supports this. And there really has been this exponential growth of social media use in the general population over the last 14 plus years. Um, Pew Research uh, Center statistics show that there has been an overall increase in 14, over 1400% 14 um, of percent of adults who use social, at least one social media site over this time period. And when you stratify this data by age group, um, you can see that social media use continued to increase across all age groups. And while there was a plateau in those aged 18 to 29, I think interestingly, there is a steady continuous climb in those adults aged 65 and up, with going from almost no social media use in 2006 to nearly 50% today. And I think there's this misconception in today's world that social media is just for young people, um, but we can clearly see that's not the case. And as our generation continues to age, I expect to see social media use uh, climb higher and higher uh, in older sections of the population. However, there is data showing that orthopedic surgeons as a group tend to stay away from using social media. Um, a study by ARP et al. published in the Journal of AAOS in 2020 queried a random sample of the AAOS online public membership directory and demonstrated that while the majority of orthopedic surgeons had one or more online profiles that were linked to a social media account, these social media accounts were often group or hospital accounts and not their personal accounts. The personal or professional accounts linked to these profiles only, only consisted of about 2.8% of all profiles. Um, and this study also noted that Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn were the most commonly used social media sites. Amongst multiple subspecialties within orthopedics as well, there is also variation in social media use, but it remains overall low. Uh, approximately one-third of shoulder and elbow surgeons utilize Twitter, with the average shoulder and elbow surgeon having one to two social media accounts. Now, while over 50% of spine surgeons present in CSRS have a LinkedIn account, less than one-third of them use other forms of social media. And similarly, 40% of academic hand surgeons utilize LinkedIn, but only 15% have a Facebook account and only 10% have a Twitter account. In contrast, one area of orthopedics that has seen significant growth in the use of social media is residency programs. And this is probably driven um, in part by the 2020 COVID pandemic, which forced them to find new ways to engage potential applicants and inform them about their program. And um, we, we see from, the, from data that most of this growth uh, comes in the use of Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I think it's pretty relevant for us here at UCSF. And I'd like to get a shout out to our own residency Instagram that we have here, which was also started in 2020. And leading up to this talk, I was curious about how social media is used and perceived within the UCSF orthopedic department. Um, so last month, I sent out a survey to the faculty fellows and residents to gather the frequency of social media use and, and opinions on the utility of use of social media in the clinical practice. I also sent this survey out to um, colleagues from other institutions, including UCSF Fresno, UT Austin, University of Illinois Chicago, and Beaumont. And according to the results, uh, social media use is common. Uh, four out of every five respondents report social media use with the most commonly used social media sites being Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And while over 90% of respondents use social media either daily or at least once a week, only 30% of respondents utilize their social media accounts to post professional content or content related to orthopedic surgery. And this is consistent with what we've previously seen in the literature. Although many of us may have these social media accounts, they are less frequently used to help promote one's clinical practice. Additionally, only one third of respondents utilize social media or to promote their practice or plan to do so in the future. And there was an overall ambivalence about the benefits of social media for orthopedic surgery with responses split evenly between um, somewhat beneficial and minimally beneficial. But given these mixed opinions on social media, I'd love to try and show you that social media can benefit your practice in several ways. Uh, a review article by McLaughorn et al. from 2016 um, presented four main tenets to rationalize using social media in your orthopedic practice, including improved ability to deliver patient-centered care, better communication with patients, uh, social media as a latent source of new patients, and then also social media as a low-cost form of advertising relative to traditional media. And when we talk about patient-centered care, there's a concept that's known as patient activation, which refers to having the knowledge, skills, and confidence um, to manage one's health. And you can actually measure patient activation by a patient activation metric or PAM with higher PAM scores indicating increasing ability for patients to take control of their health and participate actively in their own care. And while data examining the interactions between social media and patient activation is limited, a study from the Journal of Medical and Internet Research in 2016 demonstrated the significant interaction between time spent on social media and disease knowledge 
social relationships, and patients' involvement in their personal health. And so while it's interesting that social health networking can improve patient activation, why does this matter? Well, it matters because there's data showing that improved patient engagement and activation is correlated with improved health outcomes. Uh, Green et al. stratified patients presenting to their primary care practice by quartiles with PAM score. And they observed that there is a positive correlation between level of patient activation and adherence to preventative health screening. In addition, there were lower rates of unhealthy behaviors and less ED visits and hospitalizations in patients with higher patient activation levels. And patient activation has even been shown to correlate with improved outcomes following orthopedic procedures. I think some of you may recognize the senior author on this paper from Andrews et al., which compared preoperative patient activation measure scores for patients undergoing total hip or total knee arthroplasty against several postoperative metrics. And their group found that higher PAM scores were correlated with less postoperative pain, improved postoperative mental health scores, and higher patient reported satisfaction. Similar findings have been reported in patients undergoing spine procedures. And what I feel is that these publications highlight are the opportunity for orthopedic surgeons to use social media to deliver patient-centered care and improve outcomes through concepts such as patient activation. Another interesting aspect of social media is that it can give orthopedic surgeons access to a large network of new patients that would otherwise be difficult to reach through to traditional means such as print advertising, television ads, and word of mouth referrals. And with up to 80% of internet users referencing online health information, 80% of them reporting some sort of social media use, and 6.5 million healthcare related search, search queries per day, capturing even a fraction of these potential patients by having them engage with a professional social media account on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter kind of seems like a no-brainer. And when we talk about using a professional social media account to engage potential patients, it then becomes analogous to advertising. And out of curiosity, I did a quick search online to see how much traditional forms of advertising cost in the San Francisco Bay Area. Billboards cost between $1,000 and $50,000 per month, depending on location. A 30-second commercial on ABC7 could cost between $1,500 and $3,500 for a month of airtime, although this doesn't account uh, for the frequency of ad play and how price would change with that. A single print ad in the SF Chronicle costs about $600 and Google ads cost a surprising $9,000 to $10,000 per month. But then you can ask, what's the cost of using social media to advertise your practice? Essentially, it's free, um, but this is, does not include the time and effort that you spend into building your presence on social media. And while I'm not saying that social media is going to be the golden ticket that recruits an unlimited number of new patients to your practice, I can say that the overall cost profile is more favorable than what you would encounter when dealing with a more traditional advertised medium. And while this overall cost of social media is likely lower, most people also want to know whether or not their overall return on investment is also favorable. I couldn't find any literature on this topic in the field of orthopedic surgery, but there was one paper from the Aesthetic Surgery Journal published by two Los Angeles-based plastic surgeons. And they had performed a retrospective review of all patients who were seen at their practice from 2015 to 2016. As part of their routine patient interview, each patient was asked what was the single most important factor that led to your visit today. And for each patient, net proceeds from procedures and clinic visits were then attributed to this factor and used to calculate return on investment, which was net proceeds divided by invested cost. For some sources such as Instagram or word of mouth, they could only calculate net proceeds as they considered the denominator to be $0 invested in these cases. And what they found was that net positive proceeds happened from all sources, but when the actual net return per dollar invested was calculated, investment into Google search ads was actually unfavorable. Um, and they also found that the return on investment for Yelp and their practice website was between $10 and $70 per dollar spent. But interestingly, if you look at this graph on the right, the magnitude of net return for Instagram was on the order of thousands to tens of thousands of dollars, which was much higher than many other sources quoted in the article. And while the overall calculated trends in the study may be slightly weak, despite statistical significance, the difference in magnitude of return on investment between the different sources is, is striking. It suggests that social media, and most notably Instagram, can supplement practice income with minimal monetary investment. However, social media use, oh, sorry, this, this slide's a little bit out of order, but um, Curry et al. administered a 15 item questionnaire to patients who were seen in an academic orthopedic clinic. And amongst patients from different orthopedic subspecialties, they saw that there was so variability in, in patient social media use. They saw that the sports medicine patients tended to have the highest rates of social networking use, and that younger patient age was the most significant predictor of social media use. So while social media may have a favorable, favorable return on investment, as we just discussed, its efficacy, its efficacy in engaging potential patients may be based on uh, patient demographics and disease pathologies. 
And I don't know if the sports pod uh, ended up reading this paper or presenting it at a Monday conference, but they do seem to have the highest number of active professional social media accounts that I could find in the department. Beyond building a practice in advertising services, social media has the opportunity to also improve orthopedic education. There was a nice recent article in JBGS by Cole et al. that discusses the use of social media in orthopedic surgeon, or orthopedic resident training and the roles that various forms of social media platforms play in teaching trainees in the 21st century. The article breaks social media platforms into two main categories. One, social networks, which are easily accessible public platforms and two, professional networks, which are less accessible and more tailored towards building professional connections amongst orthopedic surgeons and trainees. They also discuss the positives and negatives of using Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to supplement resident education. One of the articles mentioned from this review comes from Sahu et al, who sampled tweets containing orthopedic surgery or used hashtag ortho Twitter over a one-year period. Now, of the 5,200 tweets included in the study, they observed that tweets containing hashtag ortho Twitter were more frequently coming from orthopedic surgeons and that the majority of these tweets were related to education or research topics. And while I don't agree with the author's conclusions that the use of the hashtag ortho Twitter can be used to create a specific online community of orthopedic surgeons, as really anybody can use any hashtag that they want, I did think the study nicely highlighted that not all content posted on social media by orthopedic surgeons is related to career promotion or advancing one's practice. Other studies have looked at the intersection of social media and traditional teaching courses. This study from the UK created a specific Twitter hashtag for a neuroanatomy course taken by medical students at the University of Sussex, with the idea that incorporating social media into the course would foster a supportive community, increase student engagement in course, with course materials, and provide a forum to post questions about difficult topics. And they found that 91% of the student cohort either used the hashtag in posts or viewed it on Twitter, and that there was a largely positive response to this trial with favorable ratings from post-module surveys that suggested students would like to see Twitter incorporated into future courses, and that the course hashtag made it easier for them to communicate with teachers. Focus groups formed after the study also reported improved student engagement, better communication, and feedback opportunities with lecturers, and a feeling of, supportive, of a supportive network that reduced student anxiety. I think one interesting medium for orthopedic education is Instagram. Um, for those who are not familiar with how Instagram works, users can accumulate followers who have access to that user's multimedia posts. And these posts have a much higher character count limit than Twitter and allow for multiple pictures and videos to be condensed into one single high impact post. Um, two of the most followed orthopedic accounts on Twitter, Dr. Earhart Trauma and Orthopedic Trauma are fantastic teaching oriented accounts that discuss challenging cases in a comprehensive uh, manner through thoughtfully crafted posts. And one of the biggest advantages of using Instagram as an adjunct to traditional orthopedic teaching methods is the ability for followers to directly interact with users through the questions or sharing of ideas. Um, and you can see if you, if you browse on these accounts that they will start conversations with um, other users online and directly answer questions that people uh, respond to their posts with. Um, and what this essentially gives you is free access to experts in the field of orthopedic trauma, which is something that definitely is not as easily accessible um, without these online communities. Going back to the dichotomy of social and professional networks that were mentioned in this review article, I think another very important class of social media that deserves its own category are dedicated video platforms such as YouTube or Vumedi. These platforms can be used for a multitude of functions, including patient education, surgeon education, surgical technique, technique demonstration, and more. And in reality, a lot of the other social networks that are mentioned here also contain video content and have some interplay with these dedicated platforms. So YouTube was founded in 2005 and has continued to expand steadily over time. And websites such as YouTube have increased access to experts in the field of orthopedic surgery and allow these experts to disseminate knowledge over a wide area not limited by geographic boundaries. One relevant example from my own education about how I have benefited personally from YouTube comes from my Mission Bay Peas rotation, uh, during which Dr. Dieb had a scheduled case for a patient with um, fascio-scapial hemo fascio hemo dystrophy. And this is a classic combination of a rare case for a rare condition without a large body of literature supporting, um, supporting literature for me to explore during my case presentation. And while I was able to read the described technique um, from a prior publication, the limited number of available technique papers made it difficult for me to visualize the exact steps of the dissection and procedure. However, a quick YouTube search found a series of technique videos for this procedure from reputable sources. In, in under one hour, I was able to learn the entire surgical procedure from start to finish. 
Now, I have no doubt that other UCSF trainees have done similar things in the past to prepare for upcoming cases that may be difficult or more rare. Speaking of UCSF, um, our own IGOT has a particularly active YouTube channel with multiple videos uh, encompassing a wide variety of orthopedic topics. And these include cadaver dissections, live surgical cases, and lectures on current and controversial issues. And these videos are not important, not only for our residents um, and residency, but for also for residents and doctors across national and international borders who may otherwise not have access to expert knowledge in the field of orthopedics. Another major component of social media is it's used for patient education. Um, for some patients, a visit to your, your practice might be the first time ever dealing with an orthopedic provider, or may even be the one of the only times they will see a doctor for that year or potentially their life. And regardless of familiarity with the medical system, visiting a doctor's office or having surgery is a stressful event for the patient. Um, however, there are multiple YouTube videos and Instagram posts that are available today that cover a variety of preoperative and postoperative orthopedics related topics, including disease pathologies, how to prepare for surgery, what your surgery center will look like, and what your postoperative rehab protocol will be. And these are all made um, partially with the intent of lowering patient stress and making clinic visits and the day of surgery process more efficient. And there is data in the orthopedic literature that the more patients know before surgery, the lower the stress levels will be. Uh, Kastanen et al. performed a, a randomized control trial looking at patient anxiety prior to undergoing surgery for symptomatic spinal stenosis, with the intervention arm um, being administered an educational telephone discourse that was supportive of the patient's cognitive empowerment through strengthening his or her knowledge of sur surgery-related issues. And they observed that there was a significant reduction in anxiety in the intervention group prior to surgery that was sustained following surgery, while the control group only experienced a significant reduction in anxiety following surgery. There's also similar literature within the arthroplasty world uh, that reports how preoperative knowledge-based uh, interventions can reduce patient stress. And does knowledge equal, equal power? Um, potentially. A study from BMC Pediatrics surveyed patients living in Saudi Arabia about their knowledge of clubfoot, including if they had ever heard of clubfoot, uh, the sources that they use to receive the majority of their information on clubfoot and what the proper treatment was for clubfoot. And surprisingly, social media was actually the most common resource used, followed by relatives and friends, um, whereas website and print media were used by less than one third of, of parents in the study. Um, and parents who had, had heard of clubfoot were also more likely to identify the proper first line treatment, as well as the timing of that treatment than parents who had never heard of clubfoot. And while a correlation between social media use and knowledge of clubfoot was not assessed directly in this study, it seems reasonable that social media would have the ability to increase clubfoot awareness and treatment in this population. Moving on to the interplay between social media and research in orthopedics. In today's digital age, most major academic journals in orthopedics have social media accounts, with some of them having even tens of thousands of followers. And these accounts typically post about research, podcasts, and other relevant academic content to bring attention to current and emerging topics in the field. Recent focus has been placed into developing more advanced metrics that can quantify the amount of attention that research publications receive. Um, historically, research attention was based on the number of citations that a research publication received, with publications that were more frequently cited thought to have more research attention. Another more modern uh, research metric that has been suggested is the number of Twitter posts that mentions an, mention an article. Um, and while these are both great, using only journal citations or Twitter posts as a metric of attention completely disregards other outlets where publications can gain mass exposure. One of the, uh, the more prominent companies today that focuses on journal and research analytics is Altmetric, um, which describes itself as a record of attention, a measure of dissemination, and an indicator of influence and impact of scholarly research that goes beyond just counting journal citations. Uh, Outmetric has created an aggregate Outmetric Attention Score, or AAS, and some of you have probably noticed this score on journal websites, but not looked into how exactly it's derived. Um, and it's a relatively simple score where each source of attention is given a, a different weight. Mentions by news services or blogs have the highest weight, while Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube posts have relatively lower weight. And these scores exist on a relative scale with no absolute or maximum value. And although I think it is still difficult to distill research attention into a single score, Altmetric does a, a pretty good job of providing a relative attention, a, a means of comparing um, the relative attention between two different publications. And when you think about the, com the com uh, components of the score, you can consider it to be somewhat of a social media score, given that many of these components are actually social media. Um, and while the, the numbers and the colorful graphics are visually appealing, the real question becomes, is there any use for this metric or is it just another number for us to look at? 
But it turns out that AAS, along with social media attention, actually correlates with citation rate in major orthopedic research journals. Uh, Coons et al. performed a retrospective analysis of all publications from uh, AJSM, JBJS, Corin, uh, Acta Orthopedica, and KSSTA over a one-year period to see how AAS correlated with citation rates. And they found that there was a, a statistically significant positive correlation between AAS and yearly citation rate, um, and that higher citation rate was also an independent predictor of greater, greater social media attention on Twitter, Facebook, and in the news. It's often said that a picture is worth a thousand words, and I'm sure that many of you would agree that these plain text abstracts are much less visually appealing and engaging than these visual abstracts, which condense the most salient points uh, into an eye-catching infographic. And journals have been increasingly utilizing visual abstracts and social media posts to quickly capture reader interest. And in an era where visual media continues to outcompete text-based media, I think transitioning to these pictorial abstracts seems to make sense. And current research also supports this notion that pictures are worth more than words. Um, there were a couple of studies done on this, on this uh, topic. Um, they found that articles from arthroscopy that were presented as visual infographics had higher AAS scores and more social media mentions than articles that were presented in a traditional text-based fashion. And additionally, articles from the Journal of Arthroplasty that were posted on Twitter as visual abstracts demonstrated significantly more social media engagement than those were posted as plain text. Interestingly, for this latter study, these results remained consistent even when these two groups were crossed over, and that suggested that it was truly the visual nature of the abstract that drove increased engagement. Finally, let's talk a little bit about how, how social media promotes both patient and provider communities within orthopedics. We've talked a bit, a bit so far about how social media can allow physicians to access and engage the orthopedic patient community. But I think it's also important to mention that the other community that we need to discuss is the professional community and how social media can allow medical professionals and orthopedics to engage the community at large or to form smaller, tight-knit communities centered around single tenants or goals. And I think one of the strengths of social media is that I can easily bring these people together, um, especially similar people who may be geographically separated but are linked by shared experiences. Um, and the addition of hashtags to Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter also help to facilitate these groups by providing them with groups, almost with group-specific mottos or slogans. Um, and I found that the subspecialty of orthopedic oncology has a variety of online Facebook groups and social support groups related to bony and soft tissue sarcomas that allow patients with these relatively rare diseases to communicate and share their experiences with others. In particular, one foundation that I would love to highlight is Sarcoma Strong, which is a nonprofit, foundation, a nonprofit foundation created by Dr. Matthew DiCaprio in 2014 that aims to raise awareness of sarcomatous tumors and support sarcoma-related research. And on Instagram, um, the, ha the hashtag Sarcoma Strong has thousands of posts and serves as a rallying point for patients and families affected by sarcoma to engage in conversations and demonstrate that those living with sarcoma, to those living with sarcoma, that they are not alone in fighting their disease. As I said before, social media also has the ability to bring together uh, members of professional org organizations within orthopedics. And there was a recent review article from JBJS that was highlighting possible methods to continue closing the gender gap in orthopedics, including focusing on early exposure to the field, as well as increasing the number of female mentors and role models who hold leadership positions within societies and academic institutions. And I think relevant to this talk, uh, they also suggested the use of social media as a, as a method of outreach and a medium to bring increased awareness to the challenges and problems faced by female orthopedists. And to this end, or to this point, I think it's, it's clear that multiple societies, including the Bruce Jackson Orthopedic Society, the Perry Initiative, the Gladden Society, have all have active social media accounts, as do other organizations that are dedicated to empowering women within orthopedics, such as the She Can Fix It podcast. And going back to the data from the survey I sent out, um, when I stratified the, uh, the respondent answers regarding the usefulness of social, me social media by gender, it was interesting that females actually rated the use of social media across several domains significantly higher than males. Um, and these included social media as a medium for patient education, and professional education and engagement, but most relevant here, community engagement. Um, and I think this also kind of supports what they are talking about in that review article and that social media could be a useful tool to help improve recruitment of female applicants to the field. The use of hashtags, like we talked about, has also helped to found communities on social media centered around female surgeons. Um, hashtag I look like a surgeon and hashtag women in ortho have thousands of posts combined and help to build a more complete picture of who orthopedic surgeons are and what they look like. And I thought that was something that was particularly great during my, my research for this talk was that our own posts from the UCSF Orthopedic Surgery Instagram 
um, with the hashtag women in ortho came up as one of the featured top posts um, for that hashtag. Still, I think that many would agree that the most important social media account documenting the experience of women, experiences of women in orthopedics has been Speak of Ortho, which was founded in response to abusive behavior directed towards women in orthopedics. And stories can be submitted anonymously by residents, fellows, and attending physicians and have highlighted bullying, harassment, and discrimination that are unfortunately present within the field. And while it is disheartening to hear of these incidents, I think the Speak Up Ortho account does demonstrate the value that social media has in bringing to the, together a community and building awareness of the cause. With numerous posts highlighting how women in orthopedics feel less alone after seeing the collective experiences of others and are more confident in their decision to pursue a career in orthopedics, knowing that there is a group of like-minded professionals uh, who support them. Research has also shown that residency applicants are another group within orthopedic surgery who have significant interactions with social media. An article from JBJS by Check It's et al. Uh, surveyed applicants to a single orthopedic surgery residency with respect to their perceptions of social media use by residency programs. And they found that over 50% of applicants indicated that content posted on a residency social media account increased their interest in that program. And that over 75% of them felt that uh, orthopedic residency programs should have social media accounts. And when they looked at what type of posts were most impressionable to applicants, they saw that meet the resident posts were at the top, followed by posts about life outside of residency, and then posts about meeting uh, attendings. Um, and overall, this data suggests that social media is an effective and welcomed way to increase the applicants' interest in a residency program. But I would say it's not just enough to have a social media account, and you have to find a way to keep users engaged and interested. Um, returning to the prior study I cited by uh, Mali Apko et al. from JBJS, it was determined that the number of Instagram posts on the residency social media account actually correlated with its Instagram engagement score. And for me, this highlights the presence of, uh, that the presence of a social media account is enough to briefly interest applicants, but that successful, successful accounts must continue to post content over time that engages applicants and maintains their interest. So to sum up everything we've talked about so far, uh, social media may be helpful when building one's practice. It can be used as an adjunct to traditional educational materials. Uh, social media attention is correlated with citation rate of academic papers, and it also provides an ample opportunity to engage with specific populations and form online communities within orthopedics. However, despite all of these benefits and possible uses for social media and orthopedics, it's also important to mention some of the pitfalls associated with its use. And while I won't be presenting an exhaustive list of these pitfalls, um, given the time limitations of this talk, the goal of this section is to get you to think about how many of these pitfalls may affect you or how you would manage them if you were using social media in your own practice. And there's a relevant quote about this from Adlai Stevenson in Fortune Magazine, all the way back from 1955, which states that, uh, technology while adding a daily to our physical ease throws another daily another loop of fine wire around our souls and that we increasingly need to take the reading of a needle on a dial to discover whether we think something is good or bad right or wrong and I think his thoughts have become increasingly true when you think about social media use in the 21st century um, and that although there are these many purported benefits that I, I discussed the inherent challenges that come with social media use pose real and potentially serious problems for the modern orthopedic surgeon the first and most significant challenge present when using social media is HIPAA compliance. And I know we've all heard of HIPAA, but to, just to, do, to briefly go over what it is again, um, it is the Health Information Portability and, Account Portability and Accountability Act. And this governs the permitted use of, and disclosure of patient information uh, by covered entities, which include healthcare providers and hospitals. However, it does not uh, cover de-identified information. But the most important part here, I think, is the HIPAA privacy rule which was created in 2003. And this is the part of the act that actually levies fines, significant monetary fines of up to $1.5 million a year for unauthorized disclosure of um, identify, identified or individually identifiable health information or protected health information, PHI. And there've been several cases relating to breach of HIPAA on social media that have been reported on in the news. And while most of these cases are black or white, either people are, who are committing these violations are right or wrong, um, and these cases typically end up with responsible parties being fired or removed from their position. However, in contrast, there are likely numerous cases that happen on a daily basis that end up in this more gray zone without a clear indication of whether or not a party has actually committed a HIPAA violation. And this may ultimately be related to the interpretation of the definition of PHI, which remains somewhat vague. Um, if you looked up the definition of PHI on the US Department of Health and Human Services website, um, it comes up with a, a definition that uh, defines PHI as information relating to an individual's past, present, 
or future physical or mental health or condition, the provision of health care to the individual, or the past, present, or future payment for the provision of health care to the individual. Um, but the last section at the bottom, which is underlined here, which I found the most important and the most vague, is that it, this can also be in, uh, information for which there is reasonable basis to believe it can be used to identify the individual. Um, and so really what this means is that the definition of PHI can be modified and changed uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And to the best of my knowledge, there's really not a significant amount of prior legal precedent or legal decisions um, that are regarding the uh, use of PHI in social media. Another pitfall that is somewhat related to HIPAA compliance is medical legal liability. Um, and again, there's really no specific laws pertaining to what extent physicians are liable, if at all, when interacting with patients online. Some potential questions and medical legal issues that come up when you think about this topic include disclaimers on social media, um, would they be valid in the court of law? Does an interaction on social media constitute a patient-physician relationship? Um, does an interaction with a patient on social media imply any degree of liability? And even what constitutes inter an interaction on social media? Again, there's no definitions and lots of things are left open to interpretation. The second major pitfall is that orthopedic surgeons need to be cautious about when using both professional and personal social media accounts as maintaining professionalism with their posts and comments. And a recent study by Call et al. found that 3.5% of orthopedic surgeons' uh, social media accounts surveyed had some form of inappropriate material, whether that was breach of HIPAA, profanity, discriminatory language, sexually explicit content, or a failure to reveal conflict of interest. And while this number is relatively low, I think we really ought to shoot for a zero, close, something, something closer to 0%, uh, especially when the potential consequences of unprofessional behavior could include suspension or loss of medical license, malpractice lawsuits, and other legal actions. A third pitfall is quality control um, and the control of information that is posted on social media accounts. And while we previously discussed the advantage of the low entry cost for social media, this low entry cost also allows really anyone to open a social media account and post medical information that may be wildly misleading and or dangerous. And when we think about this, I think it's important to ask ourselves who has access to social media and does increased accessibility necessarily improve health outcomes or help disseminate accurate information? Additionally, when physicians post, they need to ensure that anything, any information that they put online is vetted and confirmed to be accurate, but there's no formal peer review process present within social media websites that actively filters out misleading posts. Sadly, information about orthopedic conditions on, online um, can often be of poor quality. And there's been multiple studies that have assessed the quality of educational content related to orthopedic topics on YouTube. Um, and quality scores are universally poor for, mo for multiple domains, including carpal tunnel syndrome, meniscus tears, rotator cuff tears, and ACL reconstruction. Um, to talk specifically about the carpal tunnel study, 78% of assessed videos on YouTube on carpal tunnel syndrome contained at least one statement that can reinforce misconceptions, uh, which is somewhat worrisome um, and also pretty surprising. However, the silver lining of these studies is that information provided by physicians consistently had higher quality scores across the board. But interestingly, the quality of YouTube videos relating to total hip and knee arthroplasty was somewhat higher. Um, there was a study from the journal of AALS by Ng et al. Um, that showed that mean discern scores, which is a measure of study quality for total hip, knee and total hip uh, videos, being of fair quality as opposed to the poor quality mentioned in prior studies. And again, consistent with prior studies, physician and academic created content in this study had higher quality and reliability than content produced by non-physicians. But this brings up another point, um, that another major problem comes uh, from the percent of information that's actually coming from physicians and academic sources. Um, and many times, the amount of information that's coming from these sources can be fairly low. I mean, you see in, in that previously cited study that it was physicians comprised less than 50% of the sources of all information on total knee online. Um, and while this is somewhat alarming, I can tell you that it also reveals an opportunity for physicians to directly contribute to improving the quality of information available on social media. Something to also mention is some of the snake oil and miracle cures that you can see posted online on social media. And while it may be easier for people to dismiss Facebook posts promoting balnea therapy as a treatment for septic arthritis or a $37 miracle back cure, other products and information that receive professional or celebrity endorsement on YouTube or Instagram, such as copper infused compression sleeves for arthritis, may have enough power to deceive consumers into using ineffective or potentially harmful treatments. And while it's ultimately up to the social media consumer to decide what they believe to be true versus false, it is important to remember that you as an orthopedic surgeon may have to dispel myths regarding diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment of orthopedic conditions that were perpetuated by social media. 
Online patient reviews and physician uh, ratings on Yelp and other social media websites can be equally difficult to, tra uh, to traverse and, and interpret. Um, these ratings can often be polarizing as patients with either very high or very low opinions of a physician seem to be the ones with the most significant motivation to post about their experiences. And this causes most physician ratings to fall right in the middle of the five point rating scale. Additionally, it is difficult to verify or validate the reviews that patients post online. And there has also been mixed evidence as to whether or not patient reviews correlate with any healthcare quality metrics. And while some patients may give you reviews for actual care provided, research has shown that ratings can be based on factors that are well beyond your control, such as ease of scheduling, staff friendliness, wait times, or even parking. Despite the controversy surrounding online patient reviews, there is evidence that social media use is correlated with more online patient reviews and or better ratings actually given by patients. And while the underlying reasons behind these findings are not entirely clear, these results do continue to shine light on the somewhat arbitrary nature of online patient reviews and raise questions regarding their validity when used as a measure of physician quality. And finally, I think it's important to talk about mental health and social media, which has been a, a hot topic as of late. Um, and this has been brought to light recently in the context of social media websites being accused of preying on the mental health of teenagers and young adults. I would say that social media is an environment that's right for users to develop feelings of inadequacy about their own lives, fear of missing out, and self-absorption. And multiple studies have found a strong link between heavy social media use and an increased risk for depression, anxiety, loneliness, self-harm, and even suicidal thoughts. Um, and so taking this into account, providers should be careful to consider these possible ramifications of heavy social media use, even when using professional social media accounts. Finally, I'd like to end by talking uh, briefly about proper use guidelines. Um, so when, you, when I looked online to see what the quote experts of social media recommended in orthopedic surgery. Um, the first mentions of, guide, of any sort of guidelines uh, came from an ICL at the Academy meeting in 2010 um, with these top 10 tips for getting started in social media. And these included things such as defining your online persona, in, uh, encouraging online discussions, and protecting yourself by using disclaimers on your accounts. Um, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't until 2019 that um, AAAOS actually laid out a set of five guidelines for social media best use practices. These included personal social media use. Um, that they, re they recommend that you remember that accounts may be visible to the general public and to treat your personal account with the same integrity as your professional account. Patient communication, um, to maintain appropriate professional boundaries and don't forget to mention that posts do not equal medical advice. Education. Uh, they said that surgeons should be careful to only provide education through peer-reviewed resources and not use social media to inform patients based on personal beliefs or anecdotes. Compliance and professionalism. That surgeons should maintain HIPAA compliance, respect patient privacy, and again, maintain professionalism. And then five, to review employer guidelines um, to make sure that, they, that uh, as a surgeon, you are compliant. Um, otherwise, you may be liable uh, for removal from your position uh, or other penalties. And for any of those who are interested, UCSF also has institutional guidelines in place for social media use, both for UCSF and non-UCSF accounts. And you can visit those websites below to take a look at those. So overall, I think the jury is still out when determining whether or not social media is incredibly beneficial to the field of orthopedics or incredibly detrimental. But it seems to me that cautious and judicious use will allow orthopedic surgeons to reap the benefits of social media while at the same time avoiding common pitfalls and perils. Um, and I remain excited to see how the relationship between social media and orthopedics will continue to evolve over time in our increasingly digitized and interconnected society. These are just a few of my references. And I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to um, everybody on this list and probably people who I haven't included on here, but uh, particularly my fiance for listening to this talk probably for at least 10 times. Um, and then all my co-residents and doctors, Diab, Pandya, Wastrak, and Lansdowne for helping me to review my slides. Um, also, again, I'd like to thank everyone here at UCSF, all the faculty and residents for being excellent mentors and friends. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank uh, some of our outside contributors from uh, the other institutions, Ramil Shah, Kevin Dunn, Karina Kachko, and Ken Mobasagi for uh, being the point people to administer my survey at their home institutions. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome any questions that you all may have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Freshman. Um, that was great and very informative. And, um, and if anybody has questions, um, please unmute yourself, raise your hand.
Yes, uh, Dr. Pandya. Hey, Ryan. Ryan, great talk. Um, you know, one question I had for you, one thing that we're seeing increasingly, which you brought up is, you know, the marketing aspects of this. Um, and it's a fine line, I think, as orthopedic surgeons, not to be selling um, kind of what you do or your services. Did you find any kind of guidelines in terms of what was the appropriate way to market services, uh, you know, through social media? Obviously, there are multiple different ways you can do that, but that seems to be increasingly being utilized to show things you do or, or techniques that you utilize and kind of what did you find in, in your research about that? Yeah, you know, and I, I think that's a really good point because I don't think there's a lot of guidelines that I, I truly came across. Some of the things that I can think about are examples from maybe the plastic surgery side of things where you have that, that's especially a specialty where you really do have to advertise services. And sometimes you've seen probably in the news or somewhere online that some of these plastic surgeons have these fairly ridiculous Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok accounts that uh, kind of go a little bit over over the edge um, and uh, use kind of shock value or those sorts of things to get patients to come in. Um, I think the difference with orthopedics for for at least some specialties is that uh, you don't really need to you, the, the advertising is not so much um, visual; it's more so functional. Um, but I, I think you're also right in the fact that there's a lot of opportunity for people to use advertising inappropriately to push, you know, um, same day quick recovery surgeries on the people who may not uh, necessarily need them or benefit from them. Um, and I think the lack of the lack of guidelines that I saw online regarding advertising and what's appropriate um, is a is a area for further like research policy, those sorts of things. Um, but the majority of what I saw was be HIPAA compliant and then be HIPAA compliant and don't promise anything to patients online. You can't promise, you know, that you're going to this procedure will complete, make you 100% better that it works for every single patient. Um, but definitely a difficult aspect to think about when you're thinking about using social media for your own practice. See, is that Dr. Diab? Hi, um, Ryan, thank you for that. Do you see a role, um, you pointed out that our, our department Instagram is not as active as it could be. Um, do you think that we should dedicate um, a focused effort on this aspect of what we do? I think we should. should be, I think there'd so. be a social media officer. Yes, I think we should have. I think we should have some emphasis placed into the department Instagram account. I know I mentioned our resident account, but I, I hadn't put any screenshots up there of our own actual orthopedic, you know, UCSF orthopedic surgery account. I think that was pr um, active previously. But if you go and look at that account, I think there's there's one post, um, and that was from several years ago. And I think the down the the upsides of having us be active in social media as a department um, and promoting the things that we do here, procedures that you, we can offer to patients, research that's performed, um, how we're engaged in the community would be a super beneficial thing. Um, that is again, like I pointed out, relatively low cost and just needs some effort from a, potentially a dedicated person who can. Um, curate content and improve our exposure to the overall community. So I think that I would, I would, if we can, highly recommend that we, in addition to the resident account, we also have continued to make that department account active with posts and um, content to help build the UCSF brand. Would this be an opportunity for the residents to lead an effort? Because we have two accounts. Um, you guys are younger and hipper, um, and it's an opportunity for you all to show us um, how best to do it. Yeah, I think it would be great to have, in addition to that, the personal resident account, with the residency account, which maybe we could focus a little bit more on, you know, meet the resident posts and those sorts of things that were mentioned to be effective in some of these studies um, to the, the overall department account kind of having residents on board as um, consultants um, to curate, you know, posts 
more um, more approach related to the overall happening, coming and going, and, and what's going on in the department, and try to craft things that are uh, potentially going to be more appealing to the broad audience. I agree. I think we should have a resident. We could have residents consulting on that for sure. Let's see, Dr. Hey Ryan, just oh sorry. Oh, uh, Dr. Schroeder had her hand up. I think something to say. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to those comments. I mean, I do think the the value of social media for a residency program and for our department is immense, but I don't think we should be relying on physicians, whether it's attending or residents with this burden. I mean, I think that our residents who run the UCSF Ortho Instagram page have done an outstanding job, but that's just <clears throat> another burden that we're placing on them to run it. It has to be approved. It has to be like to make sure it's HIPAA compliant, to make sure it's appropriate. You know, it's just one more thing that we're asking physicians to do when there are people out there that do this. And it needs, it's certainly like this is a part time job that should be taken over by somebody who can manage that. Yeah, I think what I've seen just, you know, out in the world, even very small companies have someone who's a social media officer, they hire someone for that job. And in a large department or a private practice or something like that, it's not unreasonable to hire someone to do that job. So I'll chime in here. Thanks, uh, Ryan. As I think about your talk, it's divided. It's social and media and information, and they're they're very different. Um, as a one perspective, as a disclosure, I'm a trustee of the JBJS, and the big discussion is how do the um, journals like JBJS uh, get involved in uh, social media, uh, and to what extent is it useful? Um, to what extent is peer review valued? Uh, I think people, some people just like to go look at videos and see what somebody else is doing and take it for what it is. And then there's this, the other area of emphasis has been on aggregation of information, something like ortho evidence, which uh, JBJS owns part of, um, where you have uh, an expert um, aggregating information from multiple sources to, to simplify point of care decisions. So that's another thing. Um, we do have um, uh, a social media coordinator that, uh, or I should say it's not, not a social media coordinator, but KJ does media for us. And social media is just part of the whole media thing. Um, some of it is uh, more traditional forms of uh, communication and um, indirect uh, attention that we can gather through different, different sources of media. And it's a questions to how much effort you put on um, social media. And physicians cannot uh, extricate themselves from the process. Any, anybody who's doing this needs physicians for uh, input, for content, and uh, to, to look at it. So it's um, something that we would have to do uh, together and, uh, and provide content for you know, somebody who does the posting and that kind of stuff. And by the way, if you have things that you want to have uh, posted, something happens, an event, uh, something important, uh, you publish a paper, uh, reach out to KJ and we can, we can get those things out there. So there is help, that, that kind of stuff. May not be the type of emphasis that some people uh, think we should have and we probably need to evolve, but um, it's definitely in our consciousness and, and part of what we do. Yeah, I think to that point, Dr. Vale, I, I, I completely agree with you on all that too. And I think that what you're saying kind of emphasizes that, again, it's a collective thing. It's not just on one person. So I think kind of in combining your comments and Dr. Schroeder's comments, I think we could kind of almost form a, a group or committee of people who, kind of, who are able to take on part of these tasks and, and collectively approach this um, as opposed to having the onus just lie on one individual to manage everything and one, you know, one or two individuals to produce content. So that's something that I think we, I would love to potentially talk about if, if anybody is interested in that. 
you know, there, it, it strikes me too that I, I'm, I'm certainly not the expert on the screen on social media, but there are groups of our faculty, think, look, Colleen Sabatini, Brian Feely, others, you know, Nirav, and many others who are act, actively posting and, and doing things. It's not, and they're independent and um, they're important. Uh, they're not sort of credited as a departmental effort. And, um, and I'm not sure that those aren't more important than having something more generic to the department. It's just a, al almost a question. I'm not stating that as a fact. Mm -hmm. um, but but there's, there's, there are a lot of things uh, going on um, in media, uh, or I guess you could call it social media, but it may be directed at certain audiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think both are definitely important for sure. The other thoughts, questions? It looks like we are right about at 8.30. Um, so if not, um, Dr. Freshman, thank you again. Um, that was wonderful, clearly thought provoking and um, we'll see where, where it goes from here, but um, congrats on a great talk. All right, and we'll see you all in two weeks.